So welcome to PwC IFRS Talks, your source of all things IFRS, technical accounting matters, business issues, and regulatory updates. I'm your host, Dave Walters. In today's episode, I'm joined by a newbie to the IFRS Talks podcasts, Carsten Gansauger, who's one of our German partners in our global ACS function and is a new member of the Interpretations Committee. So uh, welcome, Carsten. Glad to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Excellent. So uh, given that this is your first time, just tell us a little bit about yourself. So how long have you been an ACS partner? Well, actually, I've been in ACS uh, for uh, for around six years now. I've worked on IFRS questions for more than 20 years in total, I think, uh, in a number of different uh, roles and uh, quite a few uh, different uh, locations as well. Uh, many different topics, uh, but in, in the technical function for the last six years. And within the technical function, are there any particular speci specialisms you've got, sectors or standards? That has also evolved over time. <laughs> so, so um, uh, I start actually started uh, dealing mostly with topics such as um, revenue recognition, employee compensation, including stock stock options and other share based payment. Uh, currently, I'm more specializing on uh, FI, financial instruments and leasing topics, but that's also evolving now, uh, starting <laughs> to deal with other topics, especially as part of my uh, IFRS IC role. Excellent. And I mean, do you have a favorite accounting standard amongst them all? If you can, it's like having a favorite child. Maybe it's, <laughs> maybe it's impossible, but is there is the one that you'd be particularly keen on? Yeah, obviously the one that I'm focusing at the moment. So <laughs> financial instruments and leasing, I would say at the moment. But as I said, that's also evolving over time. Excellent, excellent. So, and I guess what has also evolved over time is your is is joining the interpretations committee. Why did you want to join the interpretations committee? Right. So I guess I guess to answer that question, I probably need to talk even even more about my background a little bit. So I've worked with uh, the global IFRS technical desks um, of three firms actually. Been a regular observer at ISB meetings. Had many audit teams on complex IFRS questions and also spent many years uh, working directly with uh, preparers. So I think um, besides the technical accounting expertise, I also bring along significant practical experience. Yeah. You know, from, from many years of working with preparers, uh, IFRS adopters and uh, other relevant stakeholders. So regardless of the role, I've always loved to work with clients and to assist them in understanding what is and what is not um, acceptable when applying the principles in the standard, right? Yes. And um, also I've been on, a, um, on three international secondments, so I've gained broad international and intercultural experience, enabling me to you know, understand different perspectives and views while it's ensuring working together efficiently in, the, in a diverse environment. So. Overall, I was keen to join the committee to do what I, what I love in my job, right? So that's solving complex accounting questions and working in a, in a diverse multinational environment and obviously ultimately contrib contribute that experience and work with the other committee members, the ISB staff and other stakeholders to make an active contribution to, to the committee's overall, overall role, which is to interpret the application of IFRS to ensure globally consistent accounting practices. So, so that's really where, um, why I was really keen to bring in that background and um, be part of that journey. Excellent. Uh, it's great to hear such enthusiasm. And, and uh, it's early days yet, but are there any things that surprised you about the Interpretations Committee process or the meetings or, or whatever? Well, I, I guess I was already kind of familiar with the processes at the committee um, based on, on my previous role as an observer. Uh, based on, you know, I'm a regular reader of papers and different updates, obviously. Mm. But I was I was quite impressed, um, I have to say, by by the warm welcome, you know, by the chair, uh, all committee members, and also the staff, which were mm. really helpful in, and responsive in the entire onboarding process and also during uh, my first IFRS IC meeting. Yes. So yeah, I, I felt like, you know, not just myself, but also the other new um, IFRS members kind of came in, in running into the first meeting. So it, I, I really thought it was an excellent cooperation from the very first meeting. Yes. Um, so I really felt like part of the team from the first minute. I was quite quite impressed by, you know, 
how quickly um, Excellent. we got integrated with that. And, and I guess it's a good job you had a quick start because the first agenda was a very full one. That's as, right. Uh, <laughs> you had many, many uh, items to discuss. So let's let's move on to, uh, a f we may not get on to all of them uh, in the time allowed, but let's get on to uh, those that we, uh, maybe have the, the widest interest. Uh, and, and one area that caught my eye, I have to say, was uh, 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 yet another a discussion of an application point in IFRS 15, the revenue standard, this particular one being the training costs to fulfill a contract. And it's been one of the more challenging areas of accounting for many years has been this, uh, has been this particular topic. IFRS 15 didn't specifically address this area, but did provide more guidance on costs generally. What were the deliberations of the Interpretations Committee? Right. So, so this question was really about the scope. Um, you know, um, the fact pattern was uh, on a very high level that um, an entity enters to a contract with a customer. And the contract is about providing uh, outsourced services, outsourced services, so to, so services to the customers of the customer, effectively, right? So outsourcing right. like a call center or things like that. And so the um, in in the fact pattern submitted, um, there were some initial training costs which were incurred by the um, entity, uh, which were necessary to train the entity's employees about you know the products and services. Um, yes. So that they could, um, so that they can fulfill the contract with the customer, and also the contract stated that the entity would be reimbursed for um, some of these training costs. Uh, and so the question really was um, whether the training costs should be capitalized. And in order to answer that question, I think uh, um, the real question is, does the IFRS 15 guidance apply or are yeah. you actually in the scope of IS 38 for, for those training costs? And so the, so the committee observed on that one that uh, paragraph 95 of IFRS 15 states that you first look at other standards before looking at IFRS 15 guidance. So you first look at IS 38 and IS 38 is clear that training costs are covered by IS 38. So yeah. the answer, the, the tentative uh, decision of the committee was that IS 38 would apply to those training costs rather than IFRS 15. And, and IS 38 would typically say you write them off when you incur them. That's right. There's so, a, no, no, now there's a separate question which wasn't considered by the committee on whether it's possible to recognize a receivable, which of course, you know, then depends on whether or not you have an unconditional right to payment. Mm. Um, but this uh, the submission and the committee's analysis focus on the question of, of whether or not you would expense the training costs on IS-30H, which the committee uh, decided you would. Uh, and and you mentioned that was a tentative decision. So is it due right. to, is it due to come back to the interpretations committee soon? Yeah, what, that, what that's plan? exactly right. There's a 60 day comment period as always. So I think it's uh, by the 25th of November uh, comments are due, and then it's gonna come back to the committee after that for finalization of the agenda decision. Uh, and I guess there will probably be uh, some fairly extensive comments on that because commercially, uh, I think people have, have argued that. As these costs are reimbursed under the contract, we should be able to uh, uh, we should be able to recognise an asset and amortise it over the contract life. Yeah, I, I would expect that there will be some comments. I mean, we had a lot. <laughs> to be honest, we had a lot of controversial topics on the agenda, so I'm I'm not sure exactly where it will rank, but <laughs> we are <laughs> certainly expecting some comments. <laughs> so we, we will. Uh, I guess maybe we'll be able to assess that in 60 days' time as to how big the post bag has been. But uh, maybe this this one will. This one that should get a reasonable post bag to the interpretations committee. So, a gentle start for you there on on the topic of training costs. Um, IFRS 15, I guess, as a new standard, it was always going to lead to questions on on application, uh, which the interpretations committee are a best place to give a view on. And there was another topic that caught my eye, uh, not least because I got heavily delayed uh, on my journey down to London earlier in the week. Uh, and this is uh, a compensation for delays or cancellations. Now, some of our listeners who've just returned from their summer holidays may indeed have experienced delays. And indeed, an unlucky few might have been so delayed that they earned compensation. As accountants, not only do we worry about the delays themselves and the impact on whether we can do our job, uh, but also we worry about the accounting for those delays. Um, what's the latest from the Interpretations Committee on this hot topic? So I think uh, that's an uh, area where the ad an agenda decision was finalized. So I think we did cover it in one of our earlier podcasts on the June um, IFRS yep. IC meeting. But the latest on that is that the, uh, you know, just to remind people about the fact pattern is basically about 
a question when you have a delayed flight, uh, whether the compensation that you pay to, to your customer, that the airline pays to, to the customer, to the passenger, whether that's um, variable consideration, therefore reduces revenue, or whether it's an expense, um, you know, uh, similar to damages mm. um, caused by the entity's products. And so the committee already uh, observed in a tentative agenda decision in the June meeting that this would be a variable consideration. And yep. so it would, re it would reduce revenue rather than be recorded as an expense. And the committee confirmed that decision. Um, okay. are also on this one, some related topics which the committee did not address. So for example, is it possible that negative revenue can exist? <laughs> So that was um, that was scoped out from the agenda decision. Um, so, but there's now, uh, you know, I guess more guidance in terms of what you know how to how to account for these payments to the customer. So, and, and I guess actually that's quite an important question given the 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 relative magnitude of the compensation for delays versus the ticket price. Certainly at the the cheaper end of the airline uh, market, you can quite often get compensation yeah. that does exceed the ticket price. Uh, so if it's been scoped out, people will need to think about what their accounting policy is in respect that's to right. those. That's yeah. right. And we also received quite a few comments, um, you know, requesting more guidance in that area. And um, that's something I think for the board to consider then as part of the post implementation review. Excellent. So you're, you're uh, adding to the board's agenda as well. Fant uh, a fantastic achievement for your first meeting. <laughs> 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 And it's obviously, we didn't submit it to the board, right? But um, it's it's a topic I think that uh, that's a candidate at least for the it's excellent. Um, and I guess it's not just airlines that are impacted by this. It's uh, it's anyone who has significant compensation for delay or, or cancellation. Exactly. So it's a fairly wide application. So that that was a finalised decision, as you say. There's then uh, IFR 16, which actually obviously isn't isn't actually. Uh, um, hasn't had a full year yet, but has already got items going to the Interpretations Committee. And there were two, I think, that uh, particularly caught my eye. The, the first was uh, the definition of a lease and shipping contract. Can you update yeah. on the conversation there? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's actually quite an interesting disc discussion. It was, I would say, quite a, a specific or niche fact pattern. But I do think it has broader relevance, again, for a number of other fact patterns as well. So the issue was about you know, whether a particular shipping contract, uh, the right to use a ship for um, for um, an extended period of time, whether or not that was a leasing contract in a, sp in, in a specific fact pattern. And uh, without going too much into the details, um, the, the contract, um, in, or in accordance with the contract, quite a few of the uh, activities were already predetermined. Right. And so the analysis really depended very much on whether or not overall the activities were predetermined. And so the, the committee observed on that one that the activities are only predetermined if all of the relevant activities are predetermined. Um, and I think that observation certainly does have broader relevance um, also in, in many mm. other industries. In fact, we do get quite a few questions on that. So I think that's uh, an observation that will be uh, quite helpful in practice because we do get a lot of questions on that also in practice. So that, that is a, a potentially narrowing the number of transactions that might fall into the lease classification. Well, it's it's just a different uh, analysis that you do, depending on right. whether or not the activities are predetermined. And uh, so, it, you know, just to, to give some background, um, if the activities are predetermined, you look at uh, who's operating the asset um, or, or whether the cost, customer is operating the asset or whether the customer was involved in the design of the assets. So that's what you do when the activities are predetermined. If yes. they are not, obviously, you have different, a completely different analysis. And that's why this question about whether or not the activities are predetermined is quite important in the analysis of whether the contract contains a lease. Excellent. Okay. So it helps you through that reasonably complicated decision tree. Exactly. That, uh, that is exactly. In, in your standard in working out uh, whether your contract contains a lease. Exactly. Excellent. So uh, having, having worked out that maybe the contract does contain a lease, there was then another question that went to 
the committee on the uh, on the very hot topic in practice that we are seeing on implementation projects around the appropriate incremental borrowing rate to use. So what was the particular uh, aspect that the interpretations committee considered? So um, on that one, that was a topic that was already discussed uh, in the uh, June meeting. And so the question really is when you, in determining the lessee's incremental borrowing rate, whether or not you would uh, need to consider the payment profile. Um, so in other words, you know, if you comp compare it to, to a loan a financing, right, whether yeah. you look at an amortizing loan or a bullet repayment loan. Right. And that was the question. And um, basically, the committee confirmed the analysis um, that was done in the June meeting, which is that the standard does not explicitly require to use the payment profile. Mm. However, um, in, in determining the incremental borrowing rate, uh, it would be uh, actually the wording was a bit tweaked in this in this regard. Um, now the final agenda decision says that it would be consistent with the board's objective yeah. uh, to use, um, you know, basically uh, or to consider the payment profile um, in coming up with a rate. So there are lots of discussions and questions questions on that um, in terms of what this means exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think it's fair to say that, you know, clearly um, the committee has not decided that an entity is always required to use the payment profile. So it is yeah. a judgment to be made by the entity what uh, interest rate to use um, because the definition of the lessee's incremental borrowing rate in the standard itself does not refer, refer to the payment profile, it just refers to a, a loan with a similar term, right? Yeah. Uh, so at the end of the day, I think it's it's a judgment decision and depending on what you, what information you have and depending on the economics of the contract, your particular situation, uh, you need to make a judgment in coming up with an appropriate uh, interest rate that uh, reflects the definition of the incremental borrowing rate and the objectives around it. Excellent, so, so there's a, there's I guess a degree of clarity there coming from the interpretations committee uh, on what is actually a, a pretty challenging area in practice. Yeah. I, I yeah. certainly know from implementation projects I've seen that yeah. companies are struggling with the, the volumes of data required actually, to identify that's, the, the rates. That's exactly right. So, uh, so good luck to those listening to the podcast who are still working on their numbers. Uh, and there's, there's a helpful, I think, clarification there from the interpretations committee to to uh, to look out for. Uh, there was one other kind of item that really caught my eye, and uh, this refers back to something we mentioned actually on the previous podcast when I was talking to Tony DeBell about IFRIC 23, uh, which is effective for calendar years for 2019 onwards. Uh, having issued the interpretation, are there any other related questions the Interpretations Committee are considering at the moment? Not related to, to presentation. Um, that issue, um, that particular issue was confirmed, that tentative agenda decision was confirmed, yep. uh, which is, you know, uh, basically uh, IFRIC 23 uh, talks about the measurement of uncertain uh, yep. tax positions. Uh, and so there was a bit of discussion on whether actually um, the uh, uncertain tax um, positions meet the definition of an income tax as defined in IS-12. I think that was the, really the key to the question. And the committee yeah. confirmed that those do meet the definition of an IS-12 income tax. And therefore, IS-1 would require you to uh, separately present those uncertain tax positions as part of your you know, income tax uh, positions in your balance sheet. So that uh, that that's been finalised in good time for the for the December year end reporters. There were plenty of other items on the on the agenda uh, for the meeting, I and mean, we just don't have time to go into into detail. But are there any areas you'd just like to briefly highlight where IFRS accountants should be? alert to potential changes or something that's going on at the Interpretations Committee? Yeah, the, the one I would probably highlight uh, without going into too much detail is um, a discussion around um, hyperinflation. I right. mean, this is this is not an issue that's, you know, for, for quite, a, quite a few companies, um, it's not that material, but there are some territories out there where it is quite material. And for those that do have uh, operations in hyperinflationary e economies, 
I mean, in particular, Argentina is a is a is an is an issue for many companies in some territories, at least. So, if if you do have um, operations in Argentina or other other hyperinflationary economies, I would um, recommend to have a look at the papers and the discussion around that. I mean, on a very high level, the discussion was around how to how to present uh, foreign currency translation adjustments, how to calculate and how to present. Uh, foreign currency translation, uh, oh, sorry, cumulative translation adjustments under IS-21 if you're in a hyperinflationary economy. And particularly the issue is around when uh, to uh, to recycle mm -hmm. those cumulative translation adjustments. So if you have situations like that, I would encourage you to have a look at, at um, those papers and the related agenda decision. Excellent. And uh, obviously all of those papers and related agenda decisions are available uh, on the uh, on the ISB's uh, website, and certainly well worth a, a review for 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 those of us who are reporting in the IFRS arena. I think that's all we have time for today, uh, Carsten. So thank you very much indeed for bringing your insight uh, from your first interpretations committee meeting. And you can rest assured we'll be uh, looking for the return of Carsten uh, uh, in uh, as subsequent interpretations committee meetings take place. We know they have got a, a very full agenda, so there's going to be plenty for us to talk about over the next several months. So thank you, Carsten. Thank you very much, Dave. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. So, uh, so thank you all for listening to the podcast. If you want more information on all matters IFRS, then PwC inform uh, is available pwc.com forward slash ifrs has plenty of content and uh, look forward to future podcast episodes from us and in the meantime happy accounting the preceding program was brought to you by price waterhouse coopers llp this content is for general information purposes and is not a substitute for consultation with professional advisors